Hi, and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Fredrik Larsson, and I will speak about centralized and structured logging with Serlog, Elasticsearch, etc. And it's uh, fun to see so many people coming because when I chose this topic, centralized logging, I kind of thought it's just as sexy as GDPR or something like that. But <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, some basic rules. If you have a question, raise your hand. And uh, I want you to raise a hand for another reason now, because I'm going to ask some questions. So, how many of you are .NET developers in this room? Okay, it's 50% perhaps. Java developers, front-end. Okay, how many have experience of Elasticsearch previously? Yep, okay, it's about... Uh, 10% perhaps. A common scenario is that we have some sort of web application or web API and we have users, it might be devices, it might be browsers. And we have our application log and of course we have a separate log for our web server. And I'm just going through some uh, Stone Age uh, evolution, so don't worry, I'm not going to speak how you log to files. And ba most often we have an uh, API that we send requests to, and that API might be a customer uh, date repository or something, and it's probably used by other systems as well, and that one has its own application log. And of course we have load balancing, so we have our application logs and web server logs spread out everywhere. And on top of that, we of course send some messages on a bus to another system that picks them up and uh, has its own application log. How many of you have a s uh, solution that looks kind of like this one? Uh, about 50%. How many of you think it's easy to find and understand log data? <coughs> None of you, okay. So the challenge is we have our data spread out and our engineer has some trouble to find out where to start looking and we have a business analyst and <laughs> he has no use of that log data when it's spread out in files like this. So, what is centralized logging then? It's a one-stop location for finding your data, log data, and uh, preferably it's a database. Should be searchable, of course. And it should preferably as well contain a mixture of trace and metrics and performance counters and not only the uh, application log events. And our data should be structured. And what I mean by that, we will see on the next slide soon. <coughs> okay, so the traditional solution for centralized logging is that we put everything on a file share win. And then every, the evolution is that we found out, okay, that's not good, so let's have something that can uh, pull everything from that file share log graveyard. And that is basically what Logstash does. And uh, how many of you are familiar with the ELK acronym? Okay, so I'll explain it a bit. And Elasticsearch, that is a document database and it's uh, optimized for fast querying and it's um, indexing and, and it can scale very well. And Logstash is one component that feeds data to the Elastic database and normally it 
um, reads text files and uh, transforms them and ships them into Elasticsearch. So it transforms them to JSON. And Kibana is the user interface to query Elastic, and you can have dashboards and all that stuff. Logstash then, if we are logging to a file today, that log file might look like this. So it's just a flat line of text. And can you see? Is it too small? It's fine. And uh, to uh, perform some smart queries towards this flat string, it's quite hard if I want, for instance, uh, search for all GET operations uh, that has HTTP result 200 that was executed from a Mozilla browser, for instance, then it will not be very easy. And if we change the order of our log properties, it will mess up. And what Logstash wants to achieve is to transform that into JSON so we have separate fields and we can do some smart querying. But the problem with this approach is that to be able to transform that line of log data into this JSON, we need to write something that's called grok. And it's, as you see, it's quite small, and I don't want you to be able to read that. I just want you to be able to see how much code I must do to be able to perform that easy operation. Well. It's not easy when you use Logstash and Grok filter. So this is the amount of code required to be able to transform that line into this JSON structure. And imagine then if all applications have a different amount of data that they log to this log file and stuff like that. So it will explode. Logstash will not be a good approach. So back to the challenge, with Logstash, we can go from this picture to this picture. We probably, we might succeed if we have really good rock filters and transform them and stuff. But if we don't have a strategy, we will just end up with a big ball of mud instead of this separated log files. And our engineer, now he has a possibility to ask smart question to this JSON document database. So he can search using this session ID and find a log entry. But he still has the problem that, if you re remember this slide, our information were flowing through a lot of different systems. So this will only help him find the beginning of this call chain. And how does he progress? And what if we could build something that would label a correlation ID on all our events that flow through the system? So by finding the first entry, I can find all my log data that correlates, even if it executes cross boundaries. And that is something you must consider if you want to succeed with centralized logging. So our engineer then realizes it will be a, a real uh, hard work to uh, everywhere that I log, write a log entry that I need to put this correlation ID on it. and. Uh, yeah. And what about conformity? We need to make sure that we call it correlation ID everywhere and not trace ID on some applications and stuff. And that's why I love Serilog, because Serilog has a concept of something that's called enrichers. And an enricher is that if we look on this example, the only thing I'm logging in my, in my application log here is I log method in module was called and I pass in the method name and uh, which class or module that was 
uh, my current method execution context. And one thing to notice here, if you're working with Serilog, is that I'm not using string formatting, if you're aware of that in .NET. Uh, so I'm not rendering this string. I'm sending in a string with placeholders and separate wa values. And why will I, why would I want to do that? Because Serilog will render this message. So it will be rendered like that, but it will also separate these values. So I can uh, search for everything that happened in this module or all calls to that method. And I didn't need, well, I needed to pass those parameters. But we can see I have a lot of other properties on my document here with a session ID and uh, which HTTP method and stuff. And I also have a correlation ID. And uh, how did that happen? I only logged method in med module was called. And that is what my in enrichers has done. So an enricher is a sort of interception in the logging pipeline. So when I'm bootstrapping my logger here, I am uh, hooking into enrichers, one correlation ID enricher to make sure that I get my correlation ID, and one HTTP context enricher that will try to figure out if my <coughs> execution context is an HTTP context, and it will take available data from that context and stamp it on my log entry. And there are quite a lot of these ready-made enrichers available as log or as NuGet packages that are done by the community. But it's quite easy to write your own as well. So how do I write a enricher then? And in my example here, I have a correlation ID enricher. And that one is very simple, as you can see. It only decorates my log events, which I get uh, in the enrich call. And I add a property to it. And I call it correlation ID. And I use this trace correlation manager that has an activity ID. So that is not the problem. The problem is to make this correlation ID available, especially when you're going cross boundaries or system boundaries. And one way to do that, and uh, that we have done in the project that I'm currently working on, is that in our website we have done this uh, Owen middleware. And for those in .NET world might know what that is. And basically what I'm doing here is that I check in my call, did it exist in header uh, with the key correlation ID? And if so, I take that value and I tell the correlation manager that everything that executes in the same execution context as this call have that activity ID set on it. And I also pass this correlation ID back in the response so I can let the calling client use that correlation ID on all its um, well, it can log it to its own log files, etc. So you need to figure out some contract, how you exchange this correlation ID. And in the call chain, if you haven't, ha haven't set the correlation ID here, then it's this um, system's responsibility to make sure that you spin up a new one. And the way the correlation manager works, in uh, .NET is that you will always have a correlation ID in the, or an activity ID set. I just reset it in this case with the one that I go, got from the header. And if you're putting messages on the messaging queue, you need to have some sort of contract as well there on how you label your correlation ID. Oh. 
Okay, and uh, we had about half the room that were .NET developers. How many of you are using Log4Net today? Uh, okay, it's almost half of the .NET developers then. So, the engineer thinks, oh my god, I have hundreds of places where I do this log.info, log. warning. Do I need to change all that? How do I implement serial log? Well, we saw one way to do it. It was using log for net and log stash, and we saw that log stash might not be the way to go. The preferred way would be to use serial log as a logging framework, and uh, then you have the problem that our engineer just found out that he needs to do some work. What you can do, it's not the optimal way, but there are existing Log4Net appenders that you can register that appends to Serilog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It's a way to get started, at least, so you can step by step starting to refactor and move all that code to cell log. So uh, you, you don't have to do it in one big bang. And we saw what an enricher was, and you might think, what is a sync? And the sync is uh, different targets that uh, cell log you can, and Elastic is one of them, and cell log can be used to log to a lot of different destinations. So that was our application logging. And there is also these beats available that's uh, supplied by um, Elastic. And what is a beat then? It's a system level monitoring tool. It's lightweight and it's an, well, they call it an agent. And it's something that you install on the host and it's, it's available for Linux, Windows, and Mac. So it's not tied to .NET in any way, even though these days .NET runs on all these environments. What does metric beats do then? It helps you to get metrics about your system performance, like CPU usage, memory, file system, disk I.O., network, and they also have a lot of modules to help you collect telemetry data for Docker, health check, <laughs> Kubernetes events, uh, the states of the containers in the Kubernetes cluster. You have uh, four different databases. You can see uh, if you have any uh, session starvation going on in the databases and uh, yeah, and RabbitMQ, for instance, that you can see how many dead letters, how fast do I, my message flow in the queues and stuff. And all these beats are uh, that you just can download and install on your host and uh, se set them up to log to Elastic. And for those in the .NET world, we also have the application insight. I think it's awesome for collecting telemetry data for my application. I won't get that system level telemetry in the same way as the beats, so it's a good complementary. But it requires an Azure subscription, even though my application can be on premise, I still can only run the insight in Azure. And I, it has bad support for segregating and aggregating data. And what I mean by that is that if I have all these different systems, we don't want to have this big ball of mud that everybody logs in one place. We want to be able to see data for one application and for another, and sometimes we want to aggregate them and stuff like that. And that you can do it in uh, Insight, but it's not as efficient as in uh, Elastic. And with some custom code, I have seen some attempts to, because uh, Insight have these events where you can extract them and then you can ship them, but then it will almost look like the picture we where we had the log, net, log for net and serlog and a lot of layers to get to our destination. 
And if you're then using Serilog, you need to have a really good index naming strategy, something that I have found out. And what is that and why? An index is like a separate database where you store your data or your documents. And a naming convention for that one is very important. And Serilog, oh sorry, Elastic supports this, uh, that you can have automatic increments on your index names or your databases. So you can have them separated by date. And uh, why would I want to do that? Yes, because it's it would be easy just to delete old data, so I don't need to go into my database and delete entries. I can just shard away a partition. So some sort of partitioning strategy I would recommend. And also another part of the naming strategy is that if you want to be able to uh, look at data either by system or aggregate them. You can create virtual databases by index patterns. So for instance, I can create an index pattern that is for e-commerce and I can have one for all my backend layers and to get a common view. And when I ask queries against the database or this virtual database, it's, you don't notice the difference. If it's a, if you hit one index or if it's a collection of indexes, so that is very important. And to make it even more interesting to figure out this naming strategy, it only supports starts with. So that's why I just have this dumb elastic first, so I have some way of doing this. <laughs> global virtual database. Okay, and if we have then beats to collect our telemetry, we have Serilog for application events and logging, and we have uh, Insight, perhaps, then we might someday end up with this nice dashboard where you can see all the exceptions that happens, where you can see all the performance metrics, and you can see, if, for instance, if these were uh, disks, how, what's, how much space do I have left, etc. And if you have structured data, you might want to do something else that is really interesting in Elastic. In Elastic 6, they have introduced this machine learning. Because if we look on this graph, and th these were response times, and if you want to, to put some sort of um, threshold for um, monitoring, sending out alerts as, and stuff, and where do I need to put that threshold when I want to? start sending alerts. And probably you would look to figure out, okay, I need to have it somewhere high so I can figure out when it's an actual problem. But with machine learning, it will be able to predict abnormal abnormalities in a smart way. So it will figure out that these response times are not what this is supposed to be. And you can get alerts uh, sent out uh, from the monitoring system, even though we are not uh, crashing uh, some threshold that we have set. <coughs> so this all looks good, and half of the room were not .NET developers. So for those unfortunate, well, Beats, Elastic, Grafana, are Java and Go based and web based. So all the beats are written in Go and stuff. So you can use those, it's not a problem. And there is a Serilog J because, as you know, we have a tendency in the .NET community and the Java community to look what 
everybody is doing and try to mimic it. Serilog J has not got as far as Serilog has, but uh, you have a lot of, uh, so I don't know if Enrichers is implemented yet, um, but have a look at it and it's open source, so you can just dig in if you like. And from front-end perspective, there is this Elastic JS that's preferably you can use together with Node.js to be able to send data to Elastic. And uh, that was kind of all that I, what I would present as tips from my journey. So you have something to think about when you're going to try to solve the issue or a challenge with centralized logging. Any questions? Well, and uh, after a full day of conferencing, you all look like this guy, but <laughs> still, I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>